Hello, Mr. Baron. My name is Risa Waldron. I am the student government president. We are pleased to have you here in our studio today. First of all, it's an honor to be here, Ms. Waldron, and I'm just so happy to be with the students today, and I look for the opportunity to share with you. Thank you. Beautiful studio. Welcome, welcome to Studio 2. Here are PSG 46. My name is Aiden Juscombe, and I'm your student government vice president, and also the president of MBK. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? <coughs> First of all, I am now 72 years old, 72 years young. I'm married to Inez Barron. That's my wife. Do you have any kids? If not, that's fine. I have... <laughs> Yes, I do. I have two sons, Jelani and Jawanza, and four grandchildren, <clears throat> and one more on the way. So, about Jelani and the uh, what is it? Jawanza. Jawanza. Do they have any upcoming careers? Yes, Jelani is in the camera business, like what you do in the media industry. He worked for Brick, Brooklyn Arts, New York. <clears throat> He's um, a cameraman for that. Excuse me, I have to check it in my throat. It's okay. Everyone has problems with speaking once they reach their older age. Yeah. <clears throat> <coughs> what did you say? Can we do all that? But yes, I have uh, two sons and four grandchildren. I grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Big in city. New York, yep, <clears throat> in the Lillian Wall projects. I know they call them housing developments now, but we call them projects. <clears throat> I have two older sisters and two younger brothers. So you're the middle child. Very good. So I was spoiled by my sisters, and I was the leader of my brothers. So that put me right in the middle. <clears throat> Great experience. So question. Mm -hmm. What encouraged you to be an activist? Injustices, just to see how we did not have justice, too much police brutality, too much poverty in our neighborhoods. <clears throat> we weren't getting our fair share of government resources. And as a young man, I was very angry. And as an old man, I'm still angry. <laughs> But I channel that anger in a more productive, positive direction. It's all right to be angry, but it's not all right to be out of control. You have just the right to be angry. Because <coughs> as fifth graders are learning right now, people in the, you know, the Harlem Renaissance, have you heard of it? Yes. Sir. The Harlem Renaissance. I um, lived through it. <laughs> not only did I hear of it, I lived <laughs> and experienced it, young man. That's that's very good. Thank you. So you must know what it was like to not be treated fairly when white people were, you know, mm -hmm. saying very heartful things and insults to you. Well, absolutely. It's not even back then. It's still happening now. And we bring it up to date. I was in the, when I was a teenager, I was in the Black Panther Party. Have you heard of the Black Panthers? This goes beyond the movie, the Black Panthers. Well, <coughs> first thing first, Wakanda forever. Second of all, I well, have not heard. Wakanda forever. Well, let me tell you what my concern is about that. So you don't know the real Black Panthers, but you know the fictional Black Panthers. Can you tell us about that? I most certainly will, and I'll be honored to do that. This is my problem with the film, The Black Panther, because this gen your generation will only know of this fictional character that doesn't really exist. When the real Black Panther Party, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, 1966, they started the real Black Panthers, and they had a free breakfast program. Really? Yes, they gave children free breakfast, and the people who were starving or having problems getting breakfast for their children before they went to school, the Black Panther Party fed them free breakfast. And guess what? Because they did that, the state, the country was embarrassed, so they put legislation together to give free breakfast programs to Children in 22 states because of the Black Panther Party. Wow, I was telling in that state. Yeah, and let me tell you something else. The, uh, and we'll get you in here too. The um, 
Black Panther Party gave out free health care, free medical services. They went to doctors and said, look, we can't afford health care, so will you voluntarily be in our health clinics? And they had 50, 40 health clinics in 40 states across the country. And so if you came and you needed dental care or some kind of other health things related to your health, you got it free from the Black Panther Party. They gave out free survival packages, food, free. They got a bunch of shoes and clothing for people. But anytime you hear of the Black Panthers that I was with, it's always about the guns and the shootout with the police. And you don't hear of all the great things that they did. So remember, tell your generation that there's another Black Panther understanding other than Wakanda. <laughs> so basically, the Black Panther Party was just a big group of people just trying to help other people because they weren't being treated unfairly? Correct. Correct. So that's very interesting. What do you think? Well, um, I really do think that that's kind of showing how one act of kindness can lead to another and mm -hmm. then it can turn into like this whole entire community trying to be generous to each other. And it's trying, and we're trying to help the environment slowly. Yes. Well, Madam President, I think you make a good point. I think your observations are excellent because the Black Panther Party had a great impact. Remember, I grew up in the 1960s. I told y'all I was 72 years old. See, I like y'all. That's why I told y'all my age. Um, when I grew up, there was the Civil Rights Movement. That was Martin Luther King and fighting for voting rights and fighting for the right to integrate, you know, counters and all of that. Then it was my group, the Black Power Group. We don't want to integrate. We want to own our own. So, like, in that time, it was a big battle between those who wanted to integrate and wanted to get voting rights and those of us who said, you don't want us, fine. We'll do for self. We'll own our own buildings. We'll own our own schools. We'll have our own businesses and we'll feed our own people. But you got to give us our resources. Since we're paying taxes to you, we want some of that to come back to us. So there was black power and integration. That, was, that must have been a very big event. Woo! It was huge. We had some huge battles and sometimes it was against each other and we forgot we're supposed to be fighting against the system. But And then sometimes we united. So when you hear names like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, then you're talking about Martin Luther King, civil rights, integration, Malcolm X, black power, self-determination. But guess what? After a while, even Martin Luther King said, hey, wait a minute. I don't know if this integration thing is working. And he even, before he died, said, maybe I'm integrating into a burning house. You know, maybe we need to find another way. And maybe we need to own our own stuff. And maybe we need to change the whole system and not just integrate into it, but make it a new system, a whole new system, instead of capitalism, maybe socialism. So this is what Martin Luther King said at, in his last days. Oh. Well, um, we know that you had a degree in sociology and elementary education. Why did you decide not to pursue those dreams? Well, you know what? I was working in an outpatient mental health clinic, and I was the director of an after-school program and a summer camp. Really? For, yes, for young people who had some real challenges. Um, and, you know, sometimes they, our children really are oppressed and deprived, and so they react to that environment and they say, okay, give them some Ritalin, you know, some chemotherapy. And sometimes it's just, hey, come here, sit, sit down, you know, and just have a stern conversation and show your love. Won't you show your love? So I was able to get a lot of those children, you know, to really respect me and, and get a little better and how to cope better in life. And so I did that and I was planning on going to get a master's degree in social work when I said, and I got my bachelor's degree, let me start a training company. So I started a training company, Which and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Uh, it's called Dynamics of Leadership. And I wanna, I'm gonna talk to your principal and see if I can come and do some of that training with you. 
they and then, would really appreciate that. Yes, and you know, you really would benefit, I think, for like even even for this public speaking. One of the classes I teach is effective public speaking. How do you use your body language and your voice projection, your facial expressions? Because you know, there's a study that says 90% of what you communicate is nonverbal. Really? Yes. They say your verbal, your words, and I'm going to give you an example to prove it. Your words are only 7% it's 93%, 7% effective. It's your body language and your voice variation. Let me ask y'all what you're gonna believe. I ask you, not y'all, you. <laughs> what you're gonna believe. If I said to you, leave me alone, I'm not angry, what would you believe? I would believe that you just misjudged your emotions. Right, so you would think I was what? You were acting very. What made you think that? I said, my word said I'm not. Like your body language and yeah. your tone of your voice. Exactly. Right. Let me ask you this. What if I said, what if I said, I'm so excited to be here. I'm just excited about life. I couldn't wait. Um, so I'm excited. What would you believe? Well, I would believe that you were misjudging your emotions again because... <laughs> Um, you say that you that you're excited, but again, your tone and your expressions say otherwise. Excellent, excellent, and that is my point on how you can effectively speak in public when you make a presentation. So, no matter what kind of job that you get or career that you pursue, when you get in that interview room, they're going to be judging how you're presenting yourself, even if you are. A student and have all the knowledge and stuff, they're going to be judging that. So that's why I went to that and did that teaching. And then you know what got me into electoral politics, into being an elected official? Power. Power. We didn't have any power. I believe in demonstrating and screaming and hollering for justice. I do that. I still do that. But when it's all said and done, I'm asking people in power to make a decision in my best interest. So my thing is that, why should I ask you, the local city council member, to fund the parks and fund this and give more to our schools, when I could run against you, get the seat, and I'll be in the position to make the decision and have the resources and the power to do it myself. So you're taking, so basically you're going to be taking it into your own hands. Well, into our own hands, into the community, because I'm nothing without the community. No individual <clears throat> is ever Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Ethel Baker. Together. Yes, but we have to have the people. I may get the attention, but I am actually nothing without the people. My staff, Karan Allen, is here with me. He does a lot of the work may not get the same kind of attention. So when he does great work, they're going to say, well, council member, your office, you're doing great. And I got to say, no, 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 Quran did that. <laughs> you know, and I got to pull. So you're never bigger than the people, no matter how big your ego gets. Like you see your posters and pictures and TV and, and you see these great world leaders. They are nothing without the people. If the people don't show up to the demonstration, then you're out there by yourself and the system will not be afraid of you. If the people don't show up to vote for you, you're not going to win the election. So it's people power over personal aggrandizement or personal power. That's very interesting. Well, we've also noticed that you spent much time visiting colleges, campuses, churches, prisons, and communities that organize around national and local issues. Um, is it okay if you can tell us about what they would expect from you once you visit these places and what's it called, what you hope to accomplish when you get there? See, I like to raise consciousness. We, if people just don't know, then it's hard for you to act on stuff that you just don't know. You don't have the knowledge. So I wanted to show them what power was, where power was, how to access it, one of your word principles, mm -hmm. how to access that power, but you got to know it exists in the first place. And some people say, you know, knowledge is power. 
you got to take it to another level. The applied use of knowledge is power. So just to know is one thing, but to apply what you know. That's another that's another, that's a whole nother struggle and makes it more effective. So that's why when I go to the college campuses, they were mostly predominantly black uh, college campuses. Tell them about the history that we stop using the N word because you are the first people on the planet and you shouldn't be uh, having trouble with science and math. You're the, your mothers and fathers, your ancestors were the creators of science and math, the pyramids. We are African people. That's where we came from originally. We created all these things. All of that. That's right. We we are the creators of that. Isn't that right? What do you think? Well, I think I think that is most certainly correct because um, yes, our our mothers and fathers and ancestors they have been the one who who have created all of this for us to use now. Mm -hmm. So. We wouldn't have to be struggling like how they did before. There you go. See, that's important to know that our ancestors, you know those pyramids? Your ancestors created the pyramids. You can't not know anything about mathematics to create a pyramid. They created the seven wonders of the world. Right. So it's our ancestors. I don't know about all seven, but we did. <laughs> <Not> all seven. <laughs> all seven. The Great Pyramids of Giza, definitely. Come on. I visited them. I had the opportunity to go with my wife. You went to Egypt? I went to Egypt. I saw the Mighty Sphinx. That was the most breathtaking mighty experience yes, for me. Mighty Sphinx the Sphinx is, 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 is a sight. You, you're so right. It is a sight to see. You should see it. Um, you know, when you see it in the... I saw it plenty of times in pictures, but when I turned that corner and they said, come on in, and I saw that, oh my, it took my breath. It took my breath. And then to see the uh, Nile River, you know, the great Nile River where so much life nice. came from the Nile River. We actually was on a, a little boat and I put my hands in the Nile River and put the water of the Nile River. It was a very spiritual experience because going back to Africa, see, Africa is a rich continent. African people are poor because of colonialism and exploitation by Europe. Europe went and stole all of that stuff from Africa, brought it back to Europe, and then African people became poor, but the continent is rich. Gold, diamonds, cobalt, you name it, every mineral, vegetation comes from Africa. Most of the world would be in trouble if they didn't have resources from Africa, but they should not have stolen it. They should have, they should have, have just trade, 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 right? Have a, a, a trade thing, isn't that right? Yeah. Well, um, I'm still, I'm like very impressed on how, I'm like very shocked on how, like why Europe would take the resources that Africa um, needed mm -hmm. to, like why would they take it? because they could have least traded, like what Aiden said. Right. And, but thankfully, at least the country is rich, and um, without that country, everything wouldn't probably be how it is right now. Well, Madam President, that's a brilliant analysis that you just gave. Um, why would they do that? Europe was dying. You know, not, it was very cold, so they didn't have a whole lot of natural resources like themselves. Like Africa did. Right. All they had to do was trade. The human, human thing is trade. Instead, they came down and they stole first, they stole the resources, then they stole us and had human uh, resources enslaving. And let me just say this to you while we're talking about this. This is what they don't want to learn in school because they said it'll make you angry and divisive. This is why they say, oh, we shouldn't have black history and because you're going to tell the children this, you're not going to leave here angry at white yeah, people because you learned the truth about what happened in we history. We should learn the truth. We should, learn, we, the truth. We should learn the truth. All right. Because we're a part of the truth. That's it. So you, you can't go nowhere if you don't know the truth. So that foundation there in Africa, first, we are not the original inhabitants of America. Some people say, there were some African people here, even with the indigenous people. But you can't come here from Europe, steal the land from the indigenous people, then steal us, 
and tell us to build the capitalist system, the picking cotton, making cotton king and tobacco and all of that. We do all of that. You don't pay us. We, many of us died on the journey over, called it the middle passage. We get here, and then after we do all of that, you so-called free us from slavery, and then we get here, and, and you don't want to give us our fair share that's of stuff. That's, 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 that's unfair. That's, that's unfair, unfair. right? So and it still continues to this day. Right, and that's what we got. And then some things that um, they don't want you to know, and I might get in trouble saying this to you, but so what? I stay in trouble all the time telling the truth. Lincoln did not free the slaves, the enslaved Africans. What Lincoln did, the Emancipation Proclamation, it ended slavery. No, it did not it end. Let me teach you something this time, bro. Was yes, it did not end slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation was a document that said all of those enslaved Africans in the Confederate states, remember the Confederacy, they, they left the Union to start their own Confederate states. So the, there were slave states and there were free states. So they left the Union and started their own Confederate state. Jefferson Davis was their president. So Lincoln had no jurisdiction over them because that what the Civil War was all about. They left. So now hold it. So then there was four states that were slave states that stayed. They didn't leave the Union. So Lincoln said all of those who were enslaved in the states that left, your slaves are free. But the ones that stayed, you can keep your slaves because so. you didn't, hold up, so, because you, you didn't leave. So he was saving the union, not trying to free slaves. He was saving the union, and that's what he did. And so three point, almost four million of us were enslaved after the Emancipation Proclamation, 3.9, 3.8 million of us were still enslaved, and there was 200,000 that joined them. No, no, no. I know that's a lot. We do some more reading. Uh, we had to come back. One other thing I want to start trouble with is Christopher Columbus did not discover America. Mm -hmm. People were already here, and some historians say he never stepped foot in America. Oh, well, that's a lot. Um, another question I would like to ask you is, You've been an activist for decades. What advice do you have for people who want to fight for justice like yourself? Find like-minded people. Very good question. Find like-minded people. You can't do this alone. Find an organization. I found the Black Panther Party. Then after that, I joined the Black United Front with Reverend Herbert Daughtry. And then um, Karan and I are in Operation Power now. We're in the electoral arena. you got to find people who have a like-mindedness that you have and see if you can join together. The other thing is I started right on my block. I said, you know what? I got to become, I got to get more active here in East New York. So I joined my block association right on the block. Wow. I became, it was it was mostly uh, uh, elderly sisters and so we had all the brothers. So, you know, they were so happy to see me. The first meeting, they voted me in as president. <laughs> the, the first meeting. So I became the president of the Bradford Street Block Association. We shut down the store on the corner that was selling drugs. And you know how we did it? I said, okay, I'm not going to do no Black Panther stuff with you. Don't be afraid. So we just walked up and down the block, and we put signs up saying, drug-free zone under video watch. So they thought we was somewhere videoing them, but we weren't. We just put that up there. And then when the police saw that, and they saw that, and now it's a church on the corner, and the store is gone. Really? Yes, Impressive. it's a church on the corner, and the store is gone. And, and you changed all that just because you decided to become more active. Right. Well, That's not me. Me and them sisters in the Black Association. <laughs> Once again, you can never do anything yourself. Without the community. That's right. See, it was those sisters who was willing to make that walk and put it on the line. They did that. Yeah. And you know what else? They tried to take the fire alarm boxes out of East New York. They said too many false alarms. We demonstrated, and they left them. They were going to put a, a 
telephone booths up that you had to pay a quarter at that time. Could you imagine that? It's a fire and you got to go in there, but you got a quarter. <laughs> and so we stopped that. And then they wanted to bring an environmentally hazardous incinerator in East New York. And I said, no, no, you can't do that. There's a school right there. There's a daycare center right there. And if you burn wood like that, the emissions from that carbon dioxide, all of that, nitrogen, none of that stuff is good for us. It would float up. And then the thing that they call the, the particulate matter, the PM count, that's some stuff that would come down right in your lungs. So I demonstrated. I got 200 people to demonstrate. Got churches involved, block associations, tenant associations. And guess what? About a week or two of demonstration, Actually, the trucks, there you go. I give it one more and then that's it. Walmart. Walmart. Walmart, right. Big chain, right. Wanted to come to my beloved East New York. Have you ever been out to the, uh, what is it, Gateway? Yes, Gateway. Right, you ran out to Gateway, right? We did that. Gateway was all dirt. Nothing was out there. We first had to make them do an environmental research to make sure nothing under the ground, because that used to be a landfill. So we had to clean up the environment, any methane gas that could seep through and all of that. They capped all of that. And then we wanted to build them all. And they said, uh, Walmart's coming in. I said, oh, no, they're not. Oh, no, they're not. Target. Well, hey, close. But yeah, <laughs> Target is out there. But Walmart would have taken up most of the space, they don't pay you a decent wage, they don't allow you to unionize, they have oppressive working conditions. So we said, no, you know what the our people say, you're not gonna beat Walmart, they're billionaires and you don't have the power, back to that power. To that but power. what they didn't know is I was dealing with the developer who needed my approval to build that stuff on the land, city-owned land. That's why I joined the city council, power. So he had to come to me. No matter how powerful Walmart was, they were irrelevant. The developer had to bring Walmart in. And he said, okay, I won't do it. And then he tried and they got me to sign everything. And he said no. And then he was sneaking to bring them in anyway. Really? Yes. And that's when we had our demonstrations. We exposed him and they brought in right. ShopRite, ShopRite, ShopRite's there, and if you go into ShopRite, the next time you go to ShopRite, you're going to see nothing but black people from our community working those cash registers and even middle management positions. J.C. Penney is there and some of the others, but there is no Walmart after they told me I can't beat the big giant Walmart, but with people power, belief, and faith, we won. So basically, you created that whole entire mall, the community. Well, I didn't create the mall. I allowed for it to come in. And in the interest of time, because I know we're wrapping it up, I just want to say to both of you, I have had many, many thousands of interviews. This one I enjoyed most. You are extremely intelligent. You asked excellent questions. And your composure, the way you presented yourself, makes me so proud so i know for a fact we're gonna win at everything we do